And basically, Jay and I want to talk about our careers, you know, his short career, he's only 23, as Pat said. I've been doing this for about 25 years, uh, but only full-time since 2007. And we want to just talk about the connection, you know, all the things I've learned through the years of trying to get to the point where I'm at, and how Jay kind of took advantage of, of basically the things that I taught him along the way to get to where he's at. So it's it's been a it's been an interesting ride. Uh, basically, uh, you know, I learned the hard way through a lot of this stuff because I had no mentors. I had no no way of really knowing how to do this. I would ask the pros at the time that fish for a living, which was well, basically Gary Parsons, Keith Cavias, Norb Wallach, uh, those guys. They were the only ones fishing full time on the walleye tour. So I was trying to learn from them on what to do to get to that next level. And we're going to share those stories with you today and. Jay's going to share his stories and, and whatnot, but you want to hand me that clicker, we can we can get moving. We've got a lot to talk about in a short amount of time, uh, and then we'll ask questions at the end. So, so yeah, before we... Yeah. Is the honor good? Nope. Hello. There you go. There we go. So to start out, we're both going to just briefly touch on, Pat touched on it a little bit too, um, just some tournament history, if nobody knows who we are. We come from Wisconsin, so people in Florida might not really know a walleye guy and a bass guy from Wisconsin. So just a little bit of brief history first, and then we'll go into more of the financial side on how we started and that whole scheme of things. Yep. So with my history, uh, I started my first tournament in 1995. I just did it as an amateur uh, to learn more about walleye fishing and, and try and understand the whole game of walleyes. I was a musky guy growing up. That's kind of how I got my tournament career started. Uh, quickly got burned out of muskies and just didn't want to keep pursuing those things up in Wisconsin. But uh, to touch base on some of the highlights of my career, Pat said, I won uh, two Angler of the Year titles and also two National Walleye Tour Championships. You know, and those those are the high things in my career. I mean, obviously... You always hear about the good things, but there's a lot of a lot of rough roads to get to that point. Trust me, it's you know I learned the hard way. Where Jay's he's seen what I've been through with with all my career, my ups and downs. I think uh, you know a lot of people don't understand that I was I was I learned the hard way, being that I fished for a lot of checks in tournaments. You know that was I had to cash a check to make that next house payment early in my career and. And and I'm probably the perfect guy to say, you're the guy that shouldn't be doing what you're doing. You know, early in my career, I was so stubborn headed that, you know, I, I wasn't successful. My first three years on tour, I was fishing a team circuit in the MWC and I didn't cash a check for three years. Uh, but thank God I had my wife. I mean, I started doing this the year I got married 28 years ago. She's still with me today. I don't know how, but anyway, she... Uh, She's the one that said, you need to stick with this. You need to keep keep moving along and and uh, learn as you go. You, you love what you do. You know, we've invested a lot of money in what we got, so let's keep rolling along. Um, the two-time National Wally Tour Angler of the Year was something that, you know, that meant a lot to me. I finally won a big Pro-Am championship, and uh, it just kind of keeps solidifying your career and your decisions that you made throughout the years. But for me, the MWC World Walleye Championship in 2000, that was, that was my, my, breaking, my breaking point where I, I knew I could compete. I started getting a few sponsors. This was five years into my career already. And uh, finally won that, that first championship in 2000. And then that just gives you the confidence to keep rolling. Go ahead and skip to the next one, Jay. Yeah, so now I want to touch a little bit on... Um, kind of the other side of the spectrum because he had this long run and such a long journey to get to where he's at and what's at first I just want to start out what's happened to me in the last not even year maybe year and a half um, honestly I, I'm still kind of soaking it all in right now and seeing where it's going to take me or what's going to happen but for everything to happen so fast in this industry um, the complete opposite of what happened to you was pretty crazy so I'm still learning as I go, and uh, tournament history-wise, I mean, I first started fishing out as a co-angler. Well, we'll get into that later once I get into the financial side of kind of how I started and how I learned, but um, the highlights of my career so far were 
the co-angler wins that I had. I had two co-angler wins out of the back of the boat, which was huge, um, not only for money reasons, but just for recognition in the sport. I mean, um, having those wins was huge for me. And it allowed me to give myself the confidence the next year to go out and fish as a boater because um, without that and without having the experience down south on places that I've never been to in my life, I fished Wisconsin for, I don't know, however long, and then just one year of fishing down south and then going and fishing as a boater was, uh, having those wins was huge. And then all of a sudden, you know, I qualify through the Opens in one year and I make the Elite Series and then I win an Elite Series tournament. Um, it's pretty truly remarkable thinking about it now and uh, I'm definitely humble for what happened. And those are just some short highlights of my last year and a half. So now we're gonna get into the financial side. We'll start with my dad. There I am. <laughs> yep, that's me. Bib overalls, that's the kind of kid I grew up being. We didn't, we didn't come from any money. Uh, people don't even know my mom and dad didn't even fish. You know, how did I learn how to fish growing up in a family like that? I've got older brothers that are nine and 10 years older. Uh, so they were basically almost, you know, out of the house when I started fishing. And I was lucky enough to uh, live nearby a neighborhood pond so I could go anytime I wanted all summer long and fish for whatever bit. And, uh, I had a good friend of mine that uh, had a cabin up in northern Wisconsin, and that's where we would go every weekend with him, and, and we would try and catch perch, walleyes, crappies, muskies, bass. It didn't matter. We were just trying to bend the rod. So that's kind of how I grew up fishing, but um, obviously different path than Jay took. You know, he's, he's been very fortunate in his career, but I didn't have that growing up. It was, it was uh, my passion was fishing, period. That's all I ever wanted to do. I did play a lot of baseball growing up, and, and of course, we all know how sports goes. You only get to a certain point, and then it's over. And for me, uh, I just kept falling back on fishing, and, and that's uh, ended up where I am now. But go ahead and skip to the next one, Jay. That fish you see on the left there was, was a monumental fish for me. That was in 1995 on Mille Lacs Lake. And how I got to that point was I was basically sitting at work one day, and and uh, at the time, I was building doors and windows in a factory and obviously knew that this is not what I was going to do for a living. But I took a lunch break. I opened up the In Fisherman magazine, and I saw a little ad in the corner. It said, come fish with the pros, fish as an amateur, learn from the best, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know what? I want to learn more about walleyes. I'm going to do it. So I signed up for one tournament on Mille Lacs Lake. It was in May of, of 1995. The very first day, the very first spot, that was my very first ever tournament walleye fish right there. I was fishing with Chuck Miller. Chuck's out of Green Bay. We, I can remember it like it was yesterday. We pulled up to Indian Point. He gave me a slip bobber and a hair jig. And he said, you just keep throwing that in front of the boat down this break line. And sure enough, within probably five, ten minutes, I caught that fish. Long story short, I fished three days with three different pros and couldn't believe how much I learned in three days. It was like Holy cow, this is insane. The different techniques, the different areas, sand, rocks, deep, shallow. We were all over the lake. I ended up taking second place in that very first tournament. And I didn't go there to, to cash a check. I just went there to learn how to catch walleyes. And the funny story was I was actually, I actually won that tournament. Back then we had the old leaderboards where they had to manually draw the weights on for day one, two, and three, and they would add them up. And I was in first place after day three, and I won a brand new StarCraft boat. I was like, this is crazy. I already had it figured out how to get that StarCraft home because I brought my little Tiller Ranger there. And so I talked to Norb Wallach. He's like, yep, next week, I'm going to be here all week. He says, I'll bring that boat back home for you. And about 45 minutes later, Norb comes up to me, and he's like, I got bad news. He goes, you didn't win the boat. And I'm like, are you shitting me? Like, what are, you, what are you trying to tell me? He goes, see boat number 36 right there on the co-angler side, add up his three days. And I added them up, and they had the wrong weight for that guy. So I ended up second, which to me was fine. I mean, I'm, I'm just there to learn. I took second place. I won like $4,000 in gift cards and a couple free things here and there. 
really no money. The very first thing I ordered with them gift cards was a rain suit because I ended up wearing a little rubber rain suit for that tournament and I got soaked and it was awful. But at that time, that was going to be my only tournament. I was going to fish that one walleye tournament and from there it was just going to go on my own and, and see where it took me. Skip to the next one, Jay. That day I weighed in and got my plaque for second place. This is the guy that started my career. This was Norb Wallach. Norb was a professional walleye angler that did it full time. He was from my hometown. I know his whole family. He said, you know what? He goes, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, well, I'm going home. He says, I'm going out with a rider tomorrow. You want to jump in the boat? And I had no idea what this was about. You know, this was all new to me. And so we jumped in the boat. We went out and I caught those two walleyes. We got a bunch of pictures taken and them them two fish were in magazines, paper clippings everywhere. I've still got those articles to this day. And, and that quickly told me, hey, this is how you do it full time. But at the same time, I'm like, well, I'll never get there. Norb Wallach told me, he said, you're a pretty good fisherman. He says, maybe you should think about doing all the tournaments this year as a coin angler. And I'm like, well, how am I going to get off five weeks of work? I work at a window and door factory. So I went back to work, talked to my boss. I said, can I get off four weeks for the next four tournaments? And he actually said yes. Unpaid, of course. So I traveled all over the country that summer. I went to Lake Sakakawea, Central Basin of Lake Erie. Uh, where else did I go? I don't even remember. I did not win the co-angler of the year or what they had back then. I think I finished third or something. But I learned a pile of information that summer on how to catch walleyes all over the country. And I thought, this is easy. You can go ahead and skip to the next slide, Jay. So, of course, what do you do? You go out and buy your first big boat. At the time, I had a little tiller ranger, and I went. And, this is a crazy story because I bought that boat. It was one of the pros' boats from South Dakota. And I was supposed to fish with that guy that day. And we ended up getting canceled because of weather. And he said, yeah, my boat's for sale. And I said, I really like that boat because back then everybody ran that thing. and had four tires on it. I mean, that was a big deal. So I ended up buying that boat from that pro after the season was over. And, and uh, he said, yeah, I'll just bring it to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then you can drive there and pick it up. And, and I was all happy. I just got married. We got some money now. We're starting our, our life together. Bought a crappy truck, as you can see, with shitty rims, <laughs> a bad topper. Uh, wife and I were super excited. We got to Sioux Falls. Pull into the marina, yep, there's my beautiful white and red skeeter. Got close to it, I look, one tire's flat. Oh, nice. Got inside the boat, and the guy, of course, said, you know, this boat's mint condition, it's only six months old. Every corner of that boat had a stress crack on it. Open the compartments, it's full of rust, and it's full of bottom bouncers that are moldy. And my wife said, what did we just do? So we weren't too happy about that. I drove the boat home pretty pretty mad. Very next week, we had a boat show in town. And this is kind of how my career got started in, in sponsorships. Got to, that, got to that boat show in town, started walking around, just meeting people, talking. Saw a Skeeter dealer in the corners, D&D &D Bay Marina out of Beaver Dam. He's about an hour and a half from my house. I said, hey, uh, I just bought a used Skeeter and it's, it's pretty bad. I got stress cracks in the back and consoles all cracked. Can you guys fix any of that stuff? He goes, absolutely. He goes, bring it in sooner than later. It's like January. He goes, bring it in, we'll fix you up. So I took my boat in there and he spent, I spent about two grand to get it all gel coated and fixed up. And I says, hey, what do I got to do to get a sponsorship? I had no clue. I just came out and asked him. I said, I'm just starting to fish these tournaments, and I need a sponsorship, and what do I got to do? He says, well, first got to buy a brand new Skeeter. He goes, if you do that, we can probably get you on the state team. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I just bought a boat, spent two, two grand more on it, got it fixed. So what do I got to do? I got to talk to the wife and say, hey, I can get on the state team if I buy a brand new boat. So what did I do? The very next year, I bought a brand new Skeeter and got on the state team with D&D Bay Marina. The very first boat show I went to that, that winter, I was in heaven, man. I was at the Madison Boat Show, people everywhere. I'm selling Skeeter boats. I was so happy just to be there amongst all the other guys that fish. 
Don gave me free gas for bringing my for bringing his boats from the marina and taking them back after the show, and I was in heaven. All I got was a free tank of gas out of the deal. But that's where I got my start with with you know my first sponsorship. I kind of see how it's starting to work now. I'll just keep working with these guys and see where it takes me. Fast forward about five years. Did all the boat shows, fish tournaments, got my butt whooped for years and years and years. Finally met Eric Olson, a good friend of mine. He says, you want to do the MWC as a, you know, as a team? We'll do all the tournaments together. I said, absolutely. He's like, let's, let's do this. Let's see if we can get to the championship. And that was obviously a goal to get to a, to a real championship. In 1999, in the MWC, I caught a fish at the very last minute of the very last day of that season. It was a, like a 15 and an eighth inch walleye, weighed maybe a pound. Threw it in the box, only had four fish, came to weigh in, and that's when you find out how you sit. They take the top 50 boats for, from the year and then you get to the championship. Eric and I tied for dead last. We were dead last out of the top 50, so we made the championship, that 15 inch walleye. Saved our butts to get to the championship. The very next spring, we fished that event on the Mississippi River. The championships were always the following year. We got lucky and won it. That was the very first championship I ever fished, and we won it. This is where my career took off. This was five years into it. If you look on it right there, you see I got Skeeter on my shirt and Ranger on my hat. And what happened was right there, I was a Skeeter guy still at the time. Eric was with Ranger. And I had loaned my boat because I had it at the tournament just as a backup. Some other team broke down. I said, hey, you guys, use my boat. At least you can go fish. We led the first day. We won the Pro-Am. We led the second day. We come in the third day. We had another big bag, and uh, George Little was there. George was a ranger rep at the time, and we came down to our boats to look at our fish in the live well, and he's like, boys, water. you want it. Like, it's not even going to be close. And George says, would you like to put on a ranger hat when you weigh in? I immediately knew what that meant, you know, that they've been watching and they want me as part of their team. And I said, absolutely. Because I've been looking at that 619 sitting on display by the tent over there for the last three days, and I love that boat. The very next day, I signed a deal with Ranger and been with them ever since. So it's been 24 Rangers later and, and still kicking along. But uh, go ahead, Jim. Pretty cool pictures so, for me right there, let me tell you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is me. Uh, the picture on the left is actually, well, you would know more than I do. Yeah, I'll tell a story on that fish. That was Jay's first walleye ever. Yeah, he was he was just two years old and, and threw first, him in the... First fish? Or first, first fish, first yeah. Fish. That was his first fish. He's got this, I don't know what kind of pull it is, obviously it's a... Snoopy Paul, yeah. Snoopy Paul, but that day I was actually getting checked by the warden when Jay was in the back of the boat catching walleyes. And, the, and even the warden to this day, he's, you know, he's, I knew who he was pretty well, and he's like, wow, that kid's really catching him out of the back. Because I told him, just keep fishing, kid. I'll take care of this warden, you know. And, and that was one of the fish he caught, and that's where it all began for him. Yeah, and the other picture on the right is kind of what got me hooked into bass fishing because... What most people might not know is my dad's a big walleye fisherman. He loves fishing walleyes. He loves fishing tournaments for walleyes. But when he comes home and we fish for fun at home, we always go for bass. And that was one of the first times I think we probably went out for bass pretty hard or we had a good lake at home. And that was when bass fishing kind of just started out and started to get big up by me because before then, I mean, we didn't have, um, it was mostly all walleyes. I mean, we didn't have many bass tournaments. That was when the club started starting, the nation started, um, you know, all the high school stuff. We started our own high school team, which I'll get into later. But, uh, yeah, that, that day and then fast forward to, you know, a little bit later, a couple of years later, I ended up fishing another tournament and caught another big bass that, and then the whole bass fishing scene just kind of took off for me. So I want to start out a little bit talking about um, kind of where I came from. Um, you know, coming from, you know, obviously my dad in the walleye series and 
thinking about doing the bass scene, but I wasn't necessarily 100% sure. Um, I mean, I was kind of sure that I wanted to fish bass for a living, but I knew that it was going to take a lot of risk and it was not going to be easy because obviously I didn't have recognition. I really didn't have hardly anything. Um, I, so at the time, I had three or four jobs that I worked throughout three or four years. I picked blueberries. I uh, What else did I do? I worked at a couple of restaurants and I also worked at a uh, mechanic factory pretty much. So I worked on cars. I worked at an auto shop for almost four years. So that was kind of my background doing that sort of thing. And then on top of that, when I wasn't working or going to school, um, I went to a technical college and I studied marketing. That was that was kind of my, my plan. And the auto shop job that I had, um, he let me take off to fish. It wasn't necessarily all tournaments. It would either be fun fishing, if I had to go pre-fish, anything like that. He was, um, without that job, and Dave, who's my boss, he, uh, that's huge. I mean, to have a person that understands what you want to do past the job you have now, I mean, obviously they want to keep you in the long run at that job, but seeing what you love and them being able to see that through you and they're like okay i'll let you have off so you can go do this fishing thing because i know that's what you want to do with the rest of your life it's huge because without that it's almost impossible so on the other side of work and school i also um studied and obviously the picture on the right that's that's our backyard in the middle of february or whenever when we got 40 inches of snow on our back deck. You but, know your uh, kid's pretty dedicated when he just constantly shovels a path to go off the deck because it's the same height as a boat deck. So he can go out in the back and practice flipping because that's what you do in the wintertime in Wisconsin. <laughs> you want to be good at casting, you need to cast all year round and you learn how to do it. That was Jay. I mean, there'd be a puddle in that backyard in the spring and he'd be throwing top waters, you know, seeing how to work it. I mean, that's just what he did nonstop. And it was a you know, I knew early on that Jay was probably going to end up doing this. I never pushed him to do it. It was just something he loved to do. Um, but I think he was probably 12, 13, 14 years old or something in that range. And he would, you know, he'd always say, I'm going to fish the Bassmaster Classic. And I'm like, okay, you know, do you even have a clue how hard that is to get there? You know, basically. And it was like, he was... He was never a kid that really played a lot of video games or watched a lot of TV. It was always fish, 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 fish. And one day I said, do you realize, you know, and it was in the wintertime, I said, do you realize there's some probably some kid right now in, in Texas that's actually fishing while we're up here in the frozen tundra? And I said, uh, what are you going to do to make yourself as good as that kid down in Texas who's going to be in that Bassmaster Classic someday? I said, you need to take this seriously and this was young I mean he was 13 14 years old so you need to take this very seriously if you think you're going to get to that Bassmaster Classic and it literally flipped the switch in him like he went from yeah I like to fish and I do it a lot and I like to do this to 24 7 fishing like he took it dead serious if he wasn't watching fishing on YouTube he was watching on TV or if he was on the water no matter what time, he was always doing something fishing, and, and that's kind of when his career just started taking off. So I'll, I'm not really surprised to see where he's at at this age already, but just know that it takes dedication, time, sacrifice. His lifestyle is not a normal 23-year-old lifestyle, let me tell you. Yeah, so I guess to touch on that a little bit, um, kind of like what more of I actually did when I did fishing 24 seven, I guess it's more of the studying factor and not being able to fish in the winter times. That was the biggest thing for me. Um, I really didn't have a whole lot. Of, I mean, obviously I had friends and I did other things like that, but a lot of my time was fishing. And like you said, videos and other things like that. I mean, it was 24 seven. I was addicted to it. That's all I wanted to do. And that's kind of the point that I wanted to put out. Um, rather than, you know, trying to go get sponsorships or trying to go get things that are out of your control, do things that are in your control first. Um, you know, figure out the fishing aspect first. Figure out, you know, locally where you would like to fish or even, you know, if you want to just fish around your state, maybe jump one state over, learn a body of water over there if you can. 
um, first before you start and go out and try and pursue sponsorships and things like that because um, that was one thing that my dad taught me early on was the sponsors will come if you have success. That's your first goal. The first goal is to have success and uh, that's kind of what I drove to do. All right, so fast forward a little bit. Um, the picture on the left is me and my little brother who oddly enough doesn't really like to fish a whole lot. Um, <laughs> He, he'll fish occasionally with me whenever he does, but um, he kind of took a different path, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you like fishing or you don't, it's, it's a personal thing. But we would always go up north in the summertime. We'd take a one-week designated trip up to my grandparents who lived in Eagle River, which is like two hours north of me. And we had this old pontoon that we'd always fish out of. My grandpa, actually the neighbor lended it to my grandpa to use. It had no trolling motor, just a 40-horse Johnson on it or whatever it was. And uh, we would stay up there for a week, and we would catch whatever bit. Muskies, walleyes, northerns, crappies. It didn't matter. And me and my brother would go out every day for eight, nine hours. And uh, that's kind of how, that's like what I had to look forward to when I wasn't fishing tournaments. Or I didn't have a boat at the time. I didn't have anything like that. So all I could do was just shore fish and do things like that. So that was my one-week trip that I had to look forward to, you know, when I wasn't in school or I wasn't playing baseball because I also did play baseball when I was in school for a little while um, and then fast forward to high school this is kind of past middle school and things like that um, our area really didn't have any bass teams anything like that no bass no bass fishing necessarily um, we did have one local club uh, not really a club more like a circuit trail kind of like a like an English choice trail similar to that and uh, so we decided to start a high school team, and obviously my dad helped out with that tremendously. And I didn't start the team until I was in my junior year, so I only had one year to fish in high school, which was kind of unfortunate. But uh, I did. we did end up getting to fish, I believe, four or five tournaments, and I got to travel to Missouri once, I got to travel to Illinois once, and then I also got to travel to Minnesota once. So that's kind of, it helped a lot, because at the time I had never been out of Wisconsin fishing. Um, and I didn't have my own boat yet. I really didn't have anything. So doing that was huge. And in those tournaments, I think we had a couple of good finishes, but the other two finishes weren't so good. I mean, the ones down in Illinois and down in Missouri, I got my butt kicked. I really didn't know what I was doing yet. Um, it was really early. It was really early on. I was really young. And only knowing things from Wisconsin and fishing on a pontoon boat, that's a huge learning curve going down to Missouri and trying to fish Lake of the Ozarks in a 200-boat high school tournament. Um, that's kind of, it's kind of a crazy feat to think about that now compared to what I knew then, um, was pretty wild. Okay, so fast forward to, this kind of goes back to when I worked my three jobs, I saved up enough money and I got fortunate to buy my first boat. This was my first boat. I really didn't have a vehicle to pull it with. Um, I had a... Toyota 4Runner with like almost 300,000 miles on it, but it was almost rusted to pieces. And I really didn't know how I was going to get the boat around farther than outside of 30 miles within my hometown. But uh, I got the boat. So I took it out in hometown. And while I worked at the time, I basically fished every second I could. When I'd get home from work at 3 o'clock, if I had two hours to go out before it got dark, I would be out there. I'd be out on my home river, whether uh, the fishing was good or not, or it was raining, or whatever it was doing that day. I just wanted to be on the water regardless. Um, I didn't have the craziest electronics. Everything you see on the boat was pretty much what I had on it. Just a regular trolling motor, no crazy graph, side imaging, or anything like that. And uh, that's kind of how, how I started out actually pursuing tournament fishing when I was young. So I actually had a buddy that called me up, and he was like, hey, do you want to fish this tournament trail? And that was the tournament trail I referred to, kind of like the English Choice in our hometown. And he's like, I was like, I don't know. Like, these guys have been fishing it for how many years? You know, 20 years, fishing the same bodies of water every year. And uh, I'm like, I don't know. It's a decent amount of money. And he's like, all right, let's do it. Or I said, all right, let's do it. And we ended up fishing that tournament trail. The first three tournaments we fished in it, we did all right. Um, nothing crazy. We might have cashed one check. Two of them were mediocre. And then the last tournament of that regular season on that little trail in Wisconsin, um, we ended up winning it by like two ounces. And 
I think that's the moment I realized that I could potentially, you know, beat these guys that have been doing it for so long. And when you have that breaking point, whether you're just fishing for fun or fishing in tournaments or anything like that or anything you're trying to pursue, um, that breaking point is huge because that's the moment you realize that, like, hey, I am good enough. And if I keep working towards what I want to do, like, anything is possible. I mean, you don't know. Um, obviously, events can happen or things like that. But uh, that breaking point and when we got when I got this first boat was was huge for me. Okay, so fast forward to after the boat and everything else. You guys laughing at Chase right there? You, some of you might know Chase Parsons. <laughs> We've taken a lot of money from Chase and Gary Parsons fishing tournaments. We always have a side bet, and there's just another $50 bill going. <laughs> so now I want to talk about fishing locally and kind of dominating locally before you try and expand outside your state. Um, that was a huge goal of mine because I didn't want to start fishing the big tournaments before I knew I could compete and fully compete every tournament at home and to make sure that I knew what I was doing before I left the state. Um, that was the biggest goal of mine. And another thing too with fishing locally, it's not generally the easiest thing to do. I mean, in reality, fishing locally is probably one of the hardest things to do because those guys have been on the bodies of water every day for their entire life. And, you know, a guy like me or anyone else that's 18, 19, 20 years old trying to fish locally, you're trying to gain 30 plus years of experience from somebody else that has on that body of water that's gone through those changes and everything else. So that's kind of where um, the new generation kind of came in. All the, This is when all the new electronics started starting out, the forward facing sonar and things like that, which I'll get into a little bit later. But uh Dominating locally was huge for me, and fortunately, I did win a few tournaments, which gave me confidence to go down south. The one thing about anybody that fishes for a living and got to the level that they're at to be as high as you can is they all dominated locally. That's where you need to begin is just everybody in your state knows who you are, basically. And once you get to that level, then it's time to expand your horizons and get to the regional level and start expanding from that and then get to the national level. And you can go down the list of all the guys that are in the Hall of Fame. Everybody dominated at that local level and took it to the next level. And that was the game plan for Jay growing up in the bass world was, let's take care of the local stuff first. Let's get you on top of the winter circle Start figuring that out, then we'll start expanding out into other states. So fast forward to my co-angler career. This is what I was going to do after the local things. And uh, I really honestly didn't know this was going to happen until I got a phone call from Pat and I, who his son Adam, who we mentioned earlier, um, he, Adam decided he wanted to fish the Bassmaster Opens on the pro side. And at the time, you had to have a link as a co-angler to fish all those tournaments. So Pat called me up. Adam needed a co-angler. And it was a no-brainer for me at the time because I was just, you know, starting to win locally and things like that. And I was very fortunate to have that happen to me, to be able to travel with somebody. Um, and to go back talking about fishing as a co-angler, um, so much more inexpensive for one. You can learn a lot more. Yeah. At the end goal isn't the best. I mean, you're not. You're probably not going to make money at it. But the learning curve of being a co-angler is tremendous. I mean, you. I fished. I think we fished two years total. So I fished eight tournaments in the South, and uh, the the amount of stuff that I learned in those two tournaments was unbelievable. And uh, these two pictures are uh, out of those eight tournaments. I ended up winning two as a co-angler, which was pretty unbelievable. I won uh, one in 19 and one in 2020. And uh, this gave me huge financial reasons to, to get a bigger boat to hopefully do something the next year. I wasn't sure what I was going to do yet. I didn't know if I was going to go fish as a boater. Um, I honestly didn't know what my career was going to hold at that point after fishing a co-angler. I didn't know if I should have kept fishing as a co-angler and kept learning and learning before I fished as a boater. But everyone kept telling me, oh, you need to fish as a boater, you need to fish as a boater. And I'm like, I figured I'd try it for one year and see how it went. 
and things like that. Maybe cashed a check or two. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I just wanted to learn. That's the only thing I wanted to do. So fast forward to the next year. Um, I went out and bought my first bass boat after I won those co-angler tournaments. Um, this was a 518, just an 18-foot bass boat, nothing crazy. It was a nice boat. Um, yeah, it really helped me get around and safely get down south to places that I wouldn't have been able to get to with the other boat, reliability and things like that. Um, and then fast forward to the 2021 Open season, I fished six tournaments in two divisions. And out of the Central Opens, I was fortunate enough to qualify for the Elite Series in my first year. And uh, I honestly didn't know if that was going to happen or not. And when it did happen, it was it was a shock at first because then it was all of a sudden, now i got to fish the Elite Series and come up with all the sponsor money to fish the Elite Series. Now how am I going to do that? So it was kind of a shock, but in a way, like my dreams just came true. And I'm sure for a lot of you guys too, that would be your exact same dream to fish the Elite Series. I mean, it's a lot, it was my dream growing up since I was 12 years old. And, uh, you know, fishing that season on the Opens, um, actually having Matt Schiefelbein travel with me as a co-angler. So I kind of flip-flopped spots with Adam Nye, and then I had uh, Matt fishing with me as a co-angler. was a huge help because I'm telling you, going on the road and trying to fish tournaments without somebody that you like or, you know, affiliate with, or if you don't have anybody at all, it's so hard. I mean... You can't come back at the end of a day, a 10-hour day, and sit by yourself and be like, man, I didn't catch him today. I got nobody to talk to. Like, you need somebody there. You need somebody to help you out along the way, um, whether it's just not, not even really support, just someone to talk to about the day or like, yeah, like, did you do this? Did you do that? Oh, is that not working? Let's do this. Um, just things like that. So having him was huge. Um, without that, it, it wouldn't have been possible. So that fast forward, obviously, after that whole deal and I qualified and everything else that happened this year um, was truly remarkable. And I just want to thank you guys for listening to me and my dad speak about our life's journeys. And if you have any questions, feel free because we're here. The other thing, too, I want to mention is, you know, Jay, Jay talked about it. You know, he's buying his boats. You know, from a very young age, he picked blueberries all summer just to buy that Stratos. And, you know, I never came from a, a money background. I earned everything I got. And that was the way I brought it up to him, too, was that if you're going to do this, it's it's going to be mostly on your dime. I mean, I might give you a, th a few rods and reels here to have some good equipment. But if you're going to pay an entry fee, it's out of your pocket. And that's the only way you're going to learn what a dollar is. I mean, a lot of people don't, don't – or aren't like that you know they've get stuff handed to them and, and thrown in the ring but for everything jay's earned it's been on his own dollar and and uh you know a year ago basically a little over a year ago he qualified for those elites and now you went from you know fifteen thousand in expenses for the season to just forty five thousand dollars in entry fees and we got like one month to try and figure out how to make this happen and uh Trust me when I say it was extremely stressful for both me and him at the time to say, oh, my God, we're in the Elite Series, but how are we going to make this happen? I'm not going to pay for it. So we uh, basically started out. I said, Jay, you just give me a list of who you want to pursue as sponsors. You don't have to do any sponsors I have. You can use, and that's another thing, too, is to just use equipment that you believe in. It doesn't have to be. You know, I use loose rods and reels. Uh, you, you can use whatever you want, whatever you believe in. That's the only way you're going to get a relationship started with that company is to believe in their products. So we went through a list and wrote down everybody he wanted to contact, and some of them I knew, some of them I didn't. And we just started making phone calls and, and touching base with all these companies to see, you know, what kind of financial help we could get. And thank God some of them stepped up to the plate to get him at least into that first tournament as an elite. And... uh Got lucky enough where he, he cashed two checks in his first two events in Florida and, and got the ball rolling so he wasn't financially stressed. You know, that's that's a thing nobody really talks about is, for me growing up fishing tournaments and not cashing checks, it's, it's almost impossible to do it. 
you know, stress wise, if you're fishing to try and just make that next house payment, you might as well just forget about trying to do it as a career. It's, your fishing under stress doesn't, doesn't work at all. Uh, I was lucky enough to be good enough to make checks. I was not the guy that went for the win all the time. I was a check casher. I figured if I could just cash checks and, and consistently put five in the boat, at the end of the year, things would pan out. And they did a couple times. I won two angler of the years because of that. I haven't won that many tournaments, but I don't fish that way. I just fish consistently to try and get five decent fish. So, I mean, that's kind of the whole deal of, you know, how to get where Jay was, working his way through the, the money, financial part of it, and to now get into the elites. And then you win St. Lawrence, that kind of helps. You got a little financial backing for the following year. So now this season, a lot more people know him, a lot more sponsors are, are accepting to, you know, giving him a little bit better financial situation to get into 2020, 2023 for this year. So Yeah, that was another thing too when I qualified. I qualified out of that 18 foot bass boat um, at the end of the year, the open season. And I had never driven a 21 foot bass boat in my entire life. So I really had no idea uh, what I was getting myself into and I needed obviously you need to get one I mean it's kind of a big deal at least a 20 or 21 footer for the bodies of water that they go to so uh, you know having boat sponsors come forward and, and do that is huge and without that it's almost it's almost impossible to do especially at the point where I was at in my career um, where I really didn't even have a big boat or anything like that we got a couple minutes we'll start with the questions Yeah, so the first time I got forward-facing sonar was when I got my 18-foot bass boat, and it was the second year I had it. So I ran it for, the only year I had it was the year that I qualified for the Elite Series on the Opens. That was the first year I had forward-facing sonar. And uh, to be honest with you, that year when I qualified, I really didn't use it a whole lot. Um, I fished Lake Pickwick, Smith Lake, and Grand Lake. And uh, on those three lakes, I really didn't utilize it a whole lot. I was still learning it. Uh, very much so. I was still very new at it. And, uh, you know, obviously going forward, um, my win at the St. Lawrence was huge with forward facing sonar. But uh, at that time, it wasn't a huge player for me. And that's when I got it. About the same. It's been a couple years for me uh, using forward imaging with the walleye world. It's no different than the bass world. We're, we're doing basically the same things, maybe a little different lure presentations and that. But it's, it's fishing is fishing and uh, it doesn't matter what species you're after. Right there. Great question. I feel like the sponsors, like the first couple bigger ones that I got, what they were looking for me was um, not only maybe the success portion of it, like how long is he going to last in the Elite Series? I mean, the reality of it is, there's guys that only last two years and then you get kicked out and then what, you know? So maybe it was probably the success portion of it. Is he going to have success in his first year? And then also on top of that, um, I think they, the number one thing they wanted is just brand recognition. Um, you know, whether it was, you know, make it organic when you're using your sponsor's equipment. You know, when I won the St. Lawrence, um, you know, using the loose rods and reels and the striking lures, um, just things like that where you can fit it in and it doesn't sound, you know, terrible when you're trying to say your sponsor's equipment when it really doesn't fit in in that time frame. Yeah, and that comes back to what I said earlier, is if you just consistently catch fish and perform well and cast jacks, the sponsors will take notice. I'm like, that's, that's down the road with that. And Jay had good success growing up through the ranks statewide, regionally, nationally, win a couple co-anglers, qualify. In a, so all those sponsors paid attention to the three years previous. So when he got to the elites, they knew who he was. They've been watching him, and and they they accepted him. You know, be very humble. It's something that I've always been. It's just who I am. It's who our family is. Uh, my dad was a semi truck driver and played in a polka band. And uh, you know, that's no matter what, win, lose, or draw. To be humble. Uh, did I want to stay after a tournament when I took second to last place? Well, heck no. I wanted to get in that truck and get home because I got to work the next morning. But at the same time, I'm thinking the only way I'm going to learn how to catch more walleyes is to hang around, watch the weigh-ins, 
and possibly talk to some of these teams that did very well to try and get some answers on why I got my butt kicked and why you caught them. And I did that. I would sit around and ask these guys for information. Some of them were great. Some of them didn't want to talk to me at all. But I learned a lot of stuff by just hanging around after a tournament, win, lose, or draw. We've got time for one more. Okay. Hey, Johnny. There's no doubt that's an easy question to answer is watching him win. Um, I've won some pretty big tournaments over the years. You know, they're $100,000 championships and, and things like that. But uh, I was in a tournament myself when Jay was qualifying his first three days of the St. Lawrence. I got done with the Marinette National Walleye Tour event, and uh, I traveled with Jim Schiefelbein and, and Matt Schiefelbein. They fished the walleye tour with me. We got done with that day, and, and Jay was in the lead. And it's amazing how many people on the walleye tour are now bass fans just because of him. They're watching the weigh-ins. They're texting me nonstop. And I got done with that, and it was, you know, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We get done with Marinette, talk to Jim. I said, what do you want to do? And uh, he goes, let's go. I said, all right. So we basically got in a car, and we had to be in New York by – the next day at 3 o'clock, and so we drove all night and all morning, and, and we got to New York around noon and, and basically watched Jay on the computer the whole way down the highway to see how Bass Live was doing. And, you know, I knew pretty early on that last day, I said, if he catches a six-pounder on the last day, he's, he should be fine. And he caught a six-pounder in the first 10 minutes, I think. And we high-fived in the car as we were going about 900 miles an hour down <laughs> I-80. Jim was driving. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we got there to see him weigh in, and, and, and I was doing a, a few interviews backstage just before they came in to the docks, and, you know, I broke down a couple times talking about Jay and his background, and, and then here he comes idling in. He's the first boat in for the day. He had a good bag, and, and I knew he had won because of Bass Live. I saw what he had in the box, and, and to see him idle in and tie up to the dock was Ten times better than than me winning a championship, you know. It just to see your kids succeed at any level, no matter what sport it is, what you know, if they're into whatever it is, to see them succeed is nothing like you can imagine. Crazy. Good question. No more. Way in the back. Yeah, that was that was a big question that I got asked, especially he's, he asked going to ICAST right after I won a tournament. Um, it was pretty crazy just to see, um, not really necessarily the sponsor portion of it, but just everybody walking around at ICAST congratulating me. I mean, I almost felt like the entire ICAST show congratulated me as I was walking through the aisles. I mean, it was it was really special, and uh, it's something that I'll never forget. Yeah, it's funny because when we got to the parking lot at ICAST, obviously he is, that was your first ICAST, right? Yeah, that was my first. And I've been there several times, and we got out of the truck, and I said, Jay, did you bring your Sharpie? And he's like, no. And I'm like, you're, you're about to become very, very popular. And I don't think we got 50 yards through the parking lot, and there's people walking, and they're, Jay, congratulations, you know, and he's like, thanks, you know, and I have no idea who you are. And the very first kid, when we got in the building, he was probably 14 years old, 15 yeah, was, years old. He's like, hey, Jay, con congratulations. Can I have your autograph? You know, and then I gave him a Sharpie because I had one in my backpack. I said, I won't be needing this today anyway. So <laughs> here you go. And yeah, he, he burned through some, some ink that day. It was, it was pretty wild just to see the, the fan appreciation. I'm still working on the signature, though. It's pretty <laughs> raw. Yeah. There you go.
Oh, yeah, I realized that from day one because I grew up with all my buddies in high school that wanted to do the same thing, but they didn't have that outlet. They didn't have that outlet to go home and talk about sponsors or talk about side imaging or talk about, you know, how do I zoom my graph into this point, do this and that, all the technical sides of everything. Uh, they had to go online and find it. You know, their parents might not have fished or they probably didn't or they just did it for fun. So, uh, you know, I knew that right away all throughout high school. And then, you know, I still know it to this day. I mean, still. So, yeah. I mean, the other thing I noticed, Jay, growing up early on, is, you know, I'm not a bass fisherman. I do know some some about it. Uh, but basically was that he would, you know, every day he'd come home and I would say, what did you learn today? And if you caught him or not, what did you learn? Because it's it's never ending process of learning about bass, learning about walleye. It's all the same thing. These fish swim, they got tails, they move, they, they're seasonal migrations. There's a lot that goes into it. And when he started figuring things out on his own, I, I knew in the back of my mind, he's, he's going to do good because he's figuring this stuff out at a very quick pace. Good question. Yeah, I mean, he had the quick learning curve through me. He saw the ups and downs, you know, the sponsorship levels that you got to progress through. Um, just to give you an example, in 03, I won Angler of the Year. And you think, back then, walleye fishing was pretty popular. We were fishing for some pretty big money. Sponsorships were good. I got home from that last tournament with an Angler of the Year. I'm all jacked up. I'm going to get paid. Things are great. Phone never rang, you know. No sponsors are contacting you. I got a letter in the mail two days later from one of my sponsors. Oh, cool. It's probably a congratulations. You know, I rip it open. You've been discontinued from the pro staff due to budgeting this and that. And I'm like, is this how it really works? I just want angler deer. So maybe they didn't know I just won. So I call them up. No answer. Leave a message. I just want to talk about the year, you know, I just came home, one angler of the year. I understand with budget changes how it works and just want to talk. Three phone calls later, still no answers. Never did hear from that sponsor again. Um, you know, he saw it. He understood at a young age that that phone doesn't always ring when you're, when you're winning. You have to make it ring. You know, I used to sell batteries for a living too. And, Doing all the cold calls with, with companies trying to earn their business is no different than getting a sponsorship. You know, I, t I taught him if he wants to run Gamagatsu hooks, but they don't want to pay him, that's okay. You know, get a relationship started because it's going to take time to build. So, you know, he understands that whole side of the business and he's learned very, very quickly. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, this is uh, incredible. I've been part of the NPA for a long time and and uh, been through many of these seminars and, and conferences. And to see the people show up here down in Florida is, is really good to see. There's a lot of new faces here that I've never seen at conferences, uh, people from all over the country. And this is a good organization. I want to do just say, I want to hear a round of applause for Pat and his crew. <laughs> Yeah, people really don't know what goes on behind the scenes. Pat talk, Pat and I talk all the time. We're, we don't live too far apart. And uh, to know what he does, this this corp or this partnership with the NPA and, and us, would it would be gone if Pat wasn't part of it. I'm just telling you that way. It was at a point years ago where it was this close to being bye-bye. And when Pat took over, uh, he's made it what it is today. So thank you, Pat. Yeah.